This last gauge is the amperage gauge and indicates how much current is being sent to the motor and is maxed out at 500. This is measured in amps and uses a shunt. A shunt will allow most of the current to pass through and a portion to pass through the gauge. These two components are matched. The next thing is to decide how to mount the motor and to locate all of the other components. The front motor mounting bracket was designed to mount the electric motor onto the front of the engine and connect it directly to the engine's crankshaft. What I have decided to do with the control is mount it to the shifter for personal comfort and control. The control can really go almost anywhere. After all of the components are mounted, it is a simple connect the dot, so to speak. I will simply follow the wiring diagrams and safety precautions that come with all of the components and double check them. One thing I always keep in mind is everything fails, so I will always allow it to fail safe. Okay, let's take a look at what and where everything is mounted. The motor controller is installed using four mounting screws or bolts. This unit happens to be waterproof, but it is still recommended to be placed away from moisture. The main contactor is placed on a solid surface and is important to install in a dry area. I chose to place it next to the motor controller. Here the main DC circuit breaker is mounted to the firewall with screws. This will be wired in line with the main contactor, fuse, and shunt. Now the potentiometer is also bolted to the firewall and needs to be in a relatively dry place. You can see the control mounted to the stick shift and when squeezed will control the potentiometer and micro switch on the firewall. This controls the speed of the electric motor. Here you see the conduit running from the trunk to the engine compartment. The two gauge wire is inside. I used black for negative and red for positive. Here you see the electric motor being mounted to the front end of the engine mounting bracket. Since the engine sits sideways like the original, the electric motor is near the passenger side of the vehicle. The motor is precisely centered on the bracket and the shaft of the motor is aligned with a key so that the center of the engine's crankshaft and motor are in the same place. This will later be protected from rocks, water and other debris with the original shield that came off of this location. This is important to keep the motor in good operating condition. Here I am soldering heavy duty two gauge lugs onto the wire ends. The way to get the best bond between the wire, lug and solder is to heat the lug and wire until the solder flows without direct flame. Use safety glasses anytime there is a possibility of foreign objects entering your eyes. If solder is melted into the lug first, before the wire is inserted, you will not get proper solder bonding in the center of the wire as you can see on these two cross sections of lugs. The lug on the left was heated with the wire and then solder added, and the lug on the right was filled with solder and had the wire added after. The four batteries are placed in the trunk where the spare tire is normally stored. I placed a foam pad under the batteries to reduce any shock. The batteries will have to be secured to the floor to prevent them from moving around. The batteries are wired in series, which means the voltage is added to give a total of 48 volts DC. This 48 volts matches the electric motor and controller. 
I used 48 volts mainly for safety. With higher voltages comes more risk. These batteries, like many others, can create harmful vapor, so venting is necessary. Here I am connecting one vent hose per battery, which is routed safely out of the trunk. I also have the fuse encapsulated for double protection. I have had the opportunity to add turbo to the build. Let me show you. Here is the turbo. The exhaust gases from the engine are routed through the turbo, forcing the turbine to spin. The exhaust turbine is mechanically linked to the fresh air turbine, which draws in air through the air filter and forces it into the intake manifold. When the turbo spins fast enough, or spools up, it will actually compress that air. This happens around 1800 RPMs on this model and allows you to increase the fuel that is injected into the cylinders. In return, you will increase the total horsepower of the engine. The turbo needs lubrication and cooling. The engine oil is used and will enter the turbo between the two turbines. The oil return is routed back to the oil pan to allow it to be recycled through the oil filter. This model uses engine coolant to further cool the turbo. The coolant flows in and out of the turbo through these hoses and helps to remove heat so the oil and turbo will not overheat. This will extend the life of the turbo. Here is a pressure gauge that will give you an indication of how much boost the turbo is producing. 